Sure. Okay. So I just want to say good morning to everybody, and I'm really excited that we um, have this presentation for you today as part of Indigenous Achievement Week, which is happening all this week at the uh, University of Saskatchewan. The title of our talk today is a Sinisquail and Monica Goo, Woman of the Rock. And so I just want to welcome all of our guests, everybody who's joined us today. And I do want to offer a land acknowledgement. So I want to acknowledge that this is Treaty 6 territory, the home of my ancestors, and also um, the land of the Métis. And Monica, of course, is a beautiful Métis woman who's going to uh, be speaking to us in a little bit. Uh, some housekeeping items. So please keep yourself to help with the background noise. I just wanted to make note for everybody that uh, we're going to be recording today's session and sharing it online afterwards through the uh, mentorship network website and also through other channels. We'll be monitor monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, please feel free to share them in the chat or hold them until the end because we're going to be having a question and answer period. I want to thank everybody who uh, put this event together, the College of Nursing and the Indigenous uh, Admissions Pathway Office in the College of Medicine, the Saskatchewan Indigenous Mentorship Network, and we also want to acknowledge the Aboriginal Student Centre for your work in organizing Indigenous Achievement Week and making this event possible. My as Val Arno Calche, I am the Indigenous Coordinator in the College of Medicine and the School of Rehab Science. My family roots are with Beardies and Okimasis First Nation. I must acknowledge my mother's community of Waterhand First Nation. Before I introduce our speaker today, I want to provide a brief overview about the uh, First Nations and Métis Orphan Donation and Transplantation Network. The network or in think tank is part of an emerging national effort to develop a research and intervention program in public health education and culturally safe health care services for organ donation and transplantation that targets and involves Indigenous peoples. A group of health professionals, community members, elders, researchers, and students come together regularly to learn about and discuss pressing concerns research and more related to Indigenous perspectives around organ donation and transplantation. The work directly contributes to patient-centered research and knowledge tra translation and addresses the lack of attention to this important health issue in Saskatchewan and Canada generally. This topic is particularly important given the higher representation of Indigenous people of transplant wait lists in Saskatchewan, as well as the announcement of a provincial organ donation registry. I introduce our speaker. Morgan Goulet is a Métis woman originally from the community of Cumberland House. She gift of life, a kidney from her nephew in March of 2019. She's a strong advocate for organ donation and transplantation and is part of the First Nations and Métis Organ Donation and Transplantation Network. She's a proud mother of Shannon, Josh and Sasha. Um, she's blessed with five grandchildren. Monica has worked in various school divisions throughout the province in the capacity of Indigenous consultant. She's Speakers Bureau Coordinator at the Office of the Treaty Commissioner and worked as a counselor for ITEP. Monica graduated from university in 2007 with a master's degree in business administration. Prior to that, she also acquired her Bachelor of Arts with distinction and also she's a, also a graduate with a B.Ed. from Suntep Regina. Of working with Doug Cuthan and Tasha Hubbard as a co host of two television series on APTN, Meow You Win and Sweetness of Life. She's also profiled uh, positive Indigenous lifestyles. Monica is committed to living a good life. She hopes by sharing her story, she may help someone in some way. Only hear a small part of her journey, but she's writing a book, so stay tuned. Monica, I'll turn it over to you. 
Well, I can't think of a, a better way to uh, start my day than uh, to spend it with uh, colleagues and, and friends. And of course, Val is one of my uh, longtime friends. And uh, so it's a real privilege uh, for me uh, to be here today. Uh, so I'll just begin my uh, presentation and uh, walk you through uh, some of my slides. And I think my uh, new friend there, Rhonda, is going to be assisting me with the slide uh, presentation. So she'll make the changes when I need to. So uh, in terms of my uh, cover picture there, uh, I wanted to draw attention to that beautiful uh, dress that I'm wearing. Um, that was uh, from Silver Wolf uh, Trading Post. My brother, uh, Ordine, and my sister-in-law, Fran, own that store. And uh, so they traveled around and, and uh, purchased uh, beautiful uh, items for resale. And this one was uh, sold to me a number of years ago. And it actually is the, uh, a dream that I had when I was 17 years old, that I was wearing a, a dress like that. And so in many ways, my journey has been almost like a dream-like quality to it. So I'll begin with my uh, presentation. Next slide, please, Rhonda. So I'm very honored uh, to be here today and uh, to be part of this amazing uh, group of uh, individuals in our uh, community um, that make up the First Nations and Métis Organ Donation and Transplantation Network. And fortunately, Val Arnaud Pelchier, who's the person that got me involved in this uh, committee was not there that day to be in the picture. So I just want to acknowledge that she's also a member. And uh, this uh, group got together because of uh, Dr. Uh, Caroline Tate there on, on the right, uh, the, the cute blonde woman from the, the third from the right, and then Dr. Moser. Apparently they met one rainy evening in the uh, airport and started talking about the need for uh, organ uh, donation and transplantation within uh, the Indigenous community. And so they're the ones that uh, deserve the acknowledgement for pulling together uh, a group of people to be able to uh, be part of this important network. So next slide, please. So first of all, I want to acknowledge my uh, home uh, community, Cumberland House. On the top right-hand side, is uh, my father, Arthur Goulet, and he's second from the right in this picture. And here's some of the uh, uh, dapper cronies from uh, Cumberland House, and they were attending co-op college. So that's my uh, Uncle Bill, the third one uh, from the left. And uh, so these men were part of the first recruits, and it was quite an exciting time to be involved in entrepreneurship in uh, Cumberland House. And then on the left-hand side, You'll see my mother, uh, Veronique Goulet, originally a carrier. And then uh, there's me, I'm uh, holding up my pants. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, back in those days, uh, we got a lot of hand-me-downs. And so being the youngest female in a family of 13 kids, I would imagine those were probably Arlene's pants before mine and maybe Millie's before that. So that's my sister, uh, Arlene in the center with the fashionable uh, bonnet. And she's still a bit of a fashionista today. And then my sister, uh, Millie, is to the left. And to the right is our cousin, uh, Janet Fiddler, originally a, a Mackenzie. And then in the middle, you might recognize uh, Judge Gerald Morin. He's the Cree Court uh, judge. And so to the right is his mother, Marialma Morin. And so my sis, my, uh, my mom, Veronique, and uh, Marie Alma was her uh, sister. And uh, so this is, picture is taken at the graveyard. And I wanted to mention the graveyard because one of the things that I learned as a child growing up in Cumberland House was the importance of paying tribute to our ancestors and acknowledging the people who brought us life. And one of the teachings was to honor them by going to the graveyard. So that's why this picture was taken at the graveyard. We would go there every uh, spring and every fall, and we would clean up the graveyard as a way of uh, honoring our ancestors. And my mom there with her, uh, with her hands on her hips, 
She was a really powerful leader in our community. In fact, her and my dad opened up the first, um, it was a cafeteria and it was attached to our home. And she was just a magnificent baker. So we had come home every day after school to lots and lots of baking. And uh, the aroma would just fill the air. And my dad was a real amazing entrepreneur for them to be able, like he was the first co-op store manager in uh, Cumberland House. And uh, for him and my mom, they were just like a dynamo team. And uh, my mom died uh, when I was five years old. So shortly after this uh, picture uh, was taken, uh, my mother passed away. And I suspect from what I've been told with my kidney disease is that I probably inherited my uh, kidney uh, defect from her. It was a condition called reflux action, and it affected my uh, left kidney, which I had removed when I was 26. Next slide, please. So I was reflecting on my kidney journey, and it's actually, even though it started in the womb with a defective kidney, it wasn't until I was about 13 years old that I was quite sick. And I had an x-ray taken of me when I was living in Stanley Mission going to school. At that time, Indian Affairs used to come in and they would take x-rays of all of the students in the classroom. And because I was attending a day school at that time in Stanley Mission, where my, my brother-in-law George and Josie were managing the co-op store, we were also included in the x-rays. And so when I started having uh, recurring problems with uh, infections, um, I think I was around 24 years old. I had said to uh, my doctor, you know, I keep getting these uh, urinary tract infections, but I'm not sure why. So he sent me to see a, a specialist and he said, well, I found a kidney. I found a, an x-ray of your kidney when you were 13 years old. And it already indicated that you had a defective kidney because it was mostly scar tissue by that time. So he said, did nobody ever tell you about this? And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, you're, you're going to have to have your kidney removed because it's 95% scar tissue. And so that's when I realized uh, that I had a problem with, with my kidney, even though I had been sickly as a child, no one had ever told me this. And so in 2011, my husband and I were on holidays and I started getting really, really sick. And my kidney function to that point had been about 60%. By the time we returned from uh, holidays, we were in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. I had declined my kidney function from 60% to 20% almost overnight. And so that's when I was classified as having stage four kidney disease. And that's when I started attending the chronic kidney disease clinic. And so by the time uh, 2016 rolled around, I now was diagnosed as having end stage renal failure. And I fully recall the day that I was uh, notified of this and I had to make a decision about uh, whether I was going to have um, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or I could simply choose to die. And I remember Val came with me uh, to that meeting because my husband was at work. And uh, I just wept throughout that whole thing because I couldn't really, I felt overwhelmed at this diagnosis, as you can imagine, because I had been very healthy before that. So in October the 8th of 2016, I started peritoneal um, catheter. I had a peritoneal catheter surgery. And then on November of 2016, I started peritoneal dialysis. And I was on peritoneal dialysis for two years. And then I had to prepare for hemodialysis. And they were not going to allow me to have a kidney transplant unless I had a parathyroidectomy. And so you can see on my neck, I have you have four um, parathyroids, and they removed three of them. And uh, so that was something another surgery I had to have done. And then on September the 17th, I had a fistula surgery. And that's basically my lifeline, you can still see sort of the throbbing here where they join the, the vein um, and the artery so that they can prepare you for hemodialysis. And then 
Um, on December the 12th, I had my peritoneal catheter removed and March 26th, of course, I had my flat. So Now, this here is uh, one of the best groups you could ever work with. Even though um, Val mentioned a number of jobs I've had, currently I work with the Saskatoon uh, Police Service, and I've been very honoured to be there since 2011 as the Indigenous Relations Advisor. And so this is uh, Police Chief Troy Cooper's Elders Advisory Committee. And this picture was taken on uh, December the 17th of 2019 when I had an opportunity to go back and uh, say hello to everybody. And you'll notice that I'm standing uh, beside Judy Pelly, who is also a member of our uh, First Nations Network and Métis Network. And then uh, you can see in the center, that's Nancy Linklater and her husband, Ron. Ron is a spiritual cultural advisor at St. Paul's Hospital as well. And so the two of them actually did a pipe ceremony for me. And uh, Maria Linklater is my Nichogan. She's my special friend right in the center there. And there's a lot of really wonderful elders that sit on the advisory committee. And when I got diagnosed with my uh, kidney disease, the stage four in 2011, they said a lot of prayers for me. In fact, uh, they, uh, I had my sergeant at the time, Tony Naden, take some tobacco and some prayer cloth to the uh, sweat ceremony. Many people don't know this, but the police chief, the police service participates in traditional indigenous uh, sweat ceremonies with uh, led by the link leaders out at uh, White Cap. So gratitude to uh, Chief Darcy Bear for providing the land for that. And of course, Nancy and Ron had done a pipe ceremony. So I, I thank the elders for all of their prayers, all of their love and continued support, and especially our police chief, um, Troy Cooper and uh, previous chief uh, Clive Wayhill. Next. Now I wanted to show you this picture just to show you how healthy I looked uh, before my uh, kidney disease started to ravage my body. And this is my uh, husband, my rock, my, uh, my uh, handsome uh, Keith Matlock. And this is a trip that we took to uh, Hawaii and uh, that was just a beautiful, beautiful trip to Maui. And so we were tanned, we were healthy, we were out looking at the sea turtles and just having a marvelous holiday. Next. And then of course, my special friends in the community, my special buddy there, Val Arnaud Pelchier. And then another woman that I really uh, was privileged to meet in our community when I first got here was uh, Sharon Okiwihau. And I was really involved with the Missing and Murdered Indig Indigenous Women's Network. And I continue to be an advocate for that, to raise awareness and to help people. I'm sure some of you heard about uh, Brian uh, Gallagher, one of our community Métis friends there, who recently found out that his daughter, uh, Megan Gallagher, who had been missing, is is been murdered, and so there will be an ongoing investigation with that. And then, of course, uh, Walter and uh, Maria Linklater and Kulu, that's Maria's sister there, and uh, we used to have a uh, Christmas uh, meal every year out at uh, the Indian and Maiti Friendship Center. And Walter and Maria actually gave me my name, Asinisquel, and it means woman of the rock, and many years later, I uh, met an elder who asked me if anybody had ever told me what my name means. His name is Howard Walker. Some of you might remember him from powwows and stuff. And I had been at uh, the RCMP depot for training and Howard Walker was the keynote speaker. So he said to me, have you ever had anybody explain what your name means to you? And I said, no. And he said, well, it means that you're an interpreter. And that was the first time, even after being gifted that name, that I fully understood my, the meaning of my name, Asini Esquel. Because to be an interpreter means to help people to understand each other. And he said that uh, the job that you're doing at the police service as the Indigenous Relations Advisor is actually what you're meant to do. And then I realized afterwards that because of my journey with kidney disease, that that's also 
part of my responsibility and to be a conduit for people who are suffering with kidney disease to be able to articulate and intervene and provide assistance on, on their behalf as well to help keep them alive. Next slide, please. Now, here's my special oldest granddaughter. This is Ava Grace Walls. And Ava Grace was helping me with my peritoneal dialysis and Alicia Bridges from CBC had come to interview me. And so these pictures are, are to her credit. So my husband fashioned uh, this uh, apparatus here. It's basically an old uh, lamp, standing lamp. And uh, so he created, it's called a, a two bag system. So I had to have uh, peritoneal dialysis for two years. And my daughter, Ava Grace, the picture on the right-hand side is a picture of a beautiful dress that I had purchased when I was in Hawaii. And when you're on peritoneal dialysis, you're carrying all of this fluid inside of your peritoneal cavity. And it was an awful feeling because you're laying around sometimes, you're tired and you've got this swishing noise in your belly from the peritoneal fluid. And uh, I had to do these exchanges four times a day. And then towards the end, I had to do them five times a day. And the picture on the right um, demonstrates a dream that my granddaughter Ava had before my kidney transplant. I used to walk around feeling like I was pregnant. And so one day she came over, Sasha, my daughter dropped her off and I was going to take her shopping for some winter boots. So she got to the doorway and I was pulling up my maternity pants because that's all I could wear at the time because your stomach is so distended from the fluid. And uh, so anyways, I said to her, geez, I said, I'm so tired of pulling up these pants. I said, I can sure I can hardly wait. And he said to have a kidney transplant. And she says, Grandma, she said, I had a dream. She said, I had a dream that you had your transplant. and and I think I might have been 11 or 12 years old. And she was 10 when she told me this dream. And then I said, well, tell me about it. I said, what was it like outside? And she said, grandma, it was melting. The snow was melting. And so lo and behold, I have my kidney transplant just before she turned 12. And it was uh, in uh, March. And of course, the snow was melting. So I call her dreaming woman. That's my Ava Grace Walls. Next slide, please. So here's an, a here's a picture of how much weight I gained and how one of the important functions of, uh, of uh, your kidney is to filter out the toxins out of your body. And by the time that uh, I was at this stage, my kidney function was perhaps 5% with my one remaining kidney. So I was barely staying alive. If there was no technology like uh, peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis, I would have just simply died. And I remember Dr. Moser uh, visiting my husband and I and uh, when we were in the hospital and he said, you know, back in the day, the only treatment was a Kleenex box because people had, you know, the technology for staying alive. So I'm ever so grateful that the technology was there. And at this uh, function, um, Val Arnault was there. Another, I wish I could find a photo, but Val Arnault Pelche was also here. This was one of the kidney walks organized by the uh, Kidney Foundation of Canada. Next. And this was probably one of the scariest parts of my journey. As you can imagine, uh, when you're barely functioning at 5%, I was in and out of hospital probably, I would say five times between April and May of 2018. And this is when I was very close to, to death. And I was so fortunate to have friends that checked in on me on a regular basis and uh, Arla Gustafson and Leanne Belgard are here. I was starting to have my clonic spasms because my kidney function would, had declined so much. 
I had gotten a, a case of shingles and I was in so much pain. Uh, I was ready to check out because um, I just couldn't stand being in my body anymore. And I remember, you know, there were so many days there when if I didn't have friends checking on me or if I didn't have people around to phone me, Facebook was a saving grace for me in many ways because I was able to stay connected. But as it turned out with the myclonic spasms, I was fortunate because they were caused because I had too much pharmaceuticals in my body that my body could not disperse of. And so I was in, in dire state, but they were checking my brain function because my mom used to have seizures. And so I was uh, concerned that I might have epilepsy or something, but fortunately I didn't. So uh, here's some friends offering me some cheer in RUH. Next slide, please. And there's my honey again, right in the middle there. As, you, as I mentioned, uh, with the fistula, when you would go, this is when I had started um, hemodialysis. And this might have been, this was probably the last day of hemodialysis, because I only uh, did hemo for five months. And uh, my uh, nurse there, I, some of the nurses that I uh, met were just fantastic, you know, um, just so kind and, and loving and uh, really, um, just very special people. And, and I really have a lot of love for nurses in, in my heart because, you know, some of them just go above and beyond to make sure you're comfortable and look out for you. And so uh, my husband, the nurses used to get a kick out of it because uh, at the very end of hemodialysis, like you've got like two needles inserted in your arm. So you've got one needle going out into the machine to get rid of all of the fluid, all of the blood that's in your body. In a period of four hours, what's happening is it's taking all of the all of the impurities out of your body in this hemodialysis machine, and then it's putting it back in. So that's why you need to have two needles. And so at the end of the four hour treatment, my husband would always come and hold uh, one of the uh, needle insert areas uh, closed so that I wouldn't bleed it's a way to stop the bleeding and you have to hold it for at least five minutes. And uh, so he was, he was so attentive and so wonderful and so loving because at the end of hemodialysis, I was so exhausted. There was only one day that my husband missed because he was working and no, he wasn't working by then. He had another appointment to go to. So I drove myself and I was so exhausted. I felt like I could fall asleep on the way home. So I mentioned something to the nurse about it. And she said to me, well, it's because your body's basically running a marathon. What we're doing when we hook you up to a hemodialysis machine is that we're cleaning out your blood in a period of four hours. And it's something that your body would normally do within a 48 hour period. So it's like your body's running a marathon. So when you hear about people being really exhausted after hemodialysis, that's exactly why. So it's really important for people to have a good support system. So if you're in a position to help somebody that goes for hemodialysis by giving them rides and so on, you know, I would highly encourage it because it's just amazing how exhausted you are afterwards. And it takes, took me about a day to recuperate till my next treatment. And so here now is my uh, nephew, Jimmy Searson, my uh, donor, uh, coming to see me in my last day of hemodialysis to liberate me and uh, a friend, uh, Dustin. So that was, a, that was an awesome day. You can see that I'm beaming from ear to ear. And uh, Tristan there is uh, one of my fave nurses. He spoiled me, that guy. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, happy day. Oh, my God. So here I am having lunch with some friends at uh, the Granada House when I got the call on February the 26th. And uh, luckily, one of my friends uh, took a, a photo of that exact moment when I was on the phone uh, with the transplant coordinator. Oh my God. You know, it, I, it's amazing to me because 
it's not easy to to get a kidney from a living donor because they have to almost be an exact match. In fact, my my uh, my own son, my biological son could not be my donor. Josh had gotten tested. My sister Arlene, my biological sister, was not a good match. Val Arnaud was not a good match, was ruled out because of some health stuff. And then uh, Charlotte Stang was also um, a person um, that we got so close. She was a good match. And then at the very end, uh, she was ruled out as well. And then another friend of mine was getting tested at the same time, but I'll show you that at the same slide. So Jimmy was just so excited. And uh, his his story is that uh, he felt like this kidney was mine and he was just protecting it for me. So uh, uh, I could never thank my nephew, Jimmy Searson, enough. He's my hero till the end of time for uh, keeping me here. Next, please. Celebration. <laughs> you always got to celebrate uh, staying alive, right? So here we are having dim sum in March of uh, 2019. And uh, oh my God, we were so excited about my uh, kidney transplant. And so of course there you see Val Arnaud at the bottom there, bottom right, and then uh, Crystal LaPlante, and then Arla Gustafson and uh, Senator Lillian Dick. I like calling her senator because not too many Indigenous uh, Asian people become senators. And so I like to point that out. She's retired now. And then, of course, Leanne Belgard. Leanne provided so much support when I was in hospital. I remember, I have to tell you a funny story. Uh, after my transplant, I was on prednisone and it was starting to cut off the circulation to my legs, uh, restricting the blood flow. So I had real serious mobility issues. So she had to take me for a follow-up appointment. And when we got home, I could barely make it up the stairs. So she pushed me up by the butt and we both burst out laughing and said, it's a darn good thing we know each other well. <laughs> and then uh, beside me is Marie Green. And Marie Green is a really good friend with uh, Lillian and uh, had been keeping track of my journey with kidney disease and had actually volunteered to be my donor. And so both her and Jimmy were getting tested at the same time. So I'm ever so blessed that people wanted to keep me alive. Maybe it's because I'm such a pest. I'm not sure why, but I'm just happy to be here. So uh, next slide, please. And so these are the, uh, the, the first time that my uh, nephew and I got together um, after the transplant. And oh my God, that day, I would uh, say that it was a day where the past, the present, and the future all converged in one. And I wish I had a picture here of my friend Judy Taves, because she happened to be in town from Edmonton at the time. And, uh, you know, seems to always show up when there's these special occasions. And it was such an emotional day. My sister and brother-in-law were there. Um, Jimmy's wife, uh, Chief Tammy Cook Searson from the Lac La Ronge Indian Band, uh, is the one that took the picture of Jimmy on the left and uh, captured the picture up at the top where Jimmy and I saw each other. And that's my room where I was. And you'll see the sign where it says, protect me. After you have a kidney transplant, you have anti-rejection medications. And so even though you have a kidney transplant, you're still at risk for getting infections because the anti-rejection medications lower your immune system so that you can keep your kidney. And while I was in the hospital, um, one of the nurses said, you have to name your, your you have to honor your, your donor. And uh, she said, so what does your nephew do? And I said, well, he's very physically fit. I said, and he works outdoors um, with, he works with the Red Cross and uh, he's a ranger. You know, they uh, drive their skidoos and they're out in the wilderness up in northern La Ronge. They actually help a lot of people right now uh, that are dealing with uh, COVID. And um, they make, you know, places where people can land, where helicopters can land in case somebody gets injured out in the woods. So he's a very, very uh, physically fit um, human being, generous and loving. And uh, so I had to name my uh, kidney uh, ranger. 
So that's how my my kidney got its name. And there I am enjoying my uh, one of my first cups of Tim Hortons, just a happy to be alive. <laughs> Next. And so to the left, you'll notice uh, my uh, nephew came to visit. And uh, this was 30 days after uh, the kidney transplant. He wanted to see how his auntie was doing. So he came by for a visit. And you can see I'm wearing my uh, moccasins from uh, my hometown, Cumberland House. Those were gifted to me. And uh, you'll see that beautiful totem pole there on the right-hand side was made by my dad in when he lived in Blue River, British Columbia in 1972. So I really cherish that uh, totem pole. And of course, I have my Australian Indigenous art there on the left from previous travels. So we were real happy to see each other. And uh, I pray for my nephew that he stays well and healthy and lives a very long life and re receives lots of blessing. And of course, I had a conversation with my husband uh, not too long ago where I said, do you realize that I now have the DNA of my sister Josie and my brother-in-law George because that's their son. That's my, my second oldest sister Josie and their kind, kind husband George Searson. They uh, raised us after my mom had passed away in Ontario. And so it's fascinating to me because one of the things I find now like you look at Josie and George, they're in their 80s. They're still physically active. Uh, George has a few health challenges, of course, now. But you know what? They're very, very powerful role models in our in our family because they live a very good life, uh, very caring, very kind people. And so I like to think I've got some of that energy now in my uh, in my kidney. So if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have created Jimmy and Jimmy wouldn't have had wouldn't have been able to create the perfect kidney to give to his auntie. And, uh, you know, I'm very close to, uh, to both of them. So I'm just very fortunate to, to be here. Next. So then, of course, we had to go for a nice uh, celebratory meal with uh, Marie Green. And uh, Marie Green is another hero because when she got tested to be my kidney donor, they realized that she had a very, she would make a terrific donor. And so she proceeded uh, to be an anonymous donor. So that's fantastic. She saved somebody's life by donating one of her kidneys. And uh, so we went for dinner, the three of us, and I got to listen in on some of their conversation. Sometimes I wish I'd have a video camera with me so that I could tape people when they're talking because their conversations are so fascinating. And so these are two heroes now, Jimmy Searson and Marie Green. Both of them are uh, kidney donors. And then on the right-hand side, uh, this was uh, uh, Carmen Lewandowski and uh, Val Arnaud and I. And Susanna D'April couldn't make the meeting, but the, we were having a, we were having a planning meeting we were going to have a, uh, a fundraiser for the um, First Nations and Métis people that need assistance when they're traveling. As you can imagine, some people have to travel from northern communities to go for hemodialysis. And uh, it's very exhausting for them. And uh, there hasn't been funding really available for Métis people on an ongoing basis. There's a, like a one-time... Uh, contribution from the Kidney Foundation, Saskatchewan chapter, but it's very minimal in terms of all of the expenses. And then, of course, there's Chief Troy Cooper. He's a really uh, special human being. He's Métis, and uh, he had worked in Prince Albert. So we're very fortunate to have his leadership here in our uh, community of Saskatoon. And so we are planning a fundraiser called Staying Alive, and we actually were going to have it in March of 29, 20, 2020. And then what ended up happening, of course, is COVID. So we've postponed it, but stay tuned. We will be having a fundraiser in the future. Next. And this is the walk to raise awareness. Uh, and uh, we had a really good time. 
at this walk. It's an annual walk for the Kidney Foundation. And uh, Susanna D'April is the uh, executive, uh, well, she's the coordinator consultant for the Kidney Foundation in Saskatchewan. And uh, we participate in this as a way of honoring uh, and raising awareness. And uh, so this is a fun walk. If you ever get a chance to participate in your neck of the woods, please do so. It's a great way to raise awareness. Next. And then, of course, this was the first Christmas celebration, December of 2019. And oh, my gosh, we had a marvelous time. Uh, we rented a, a clubhouse and uh, it was the first big uh, family celebration uh, that we had. Jim and Tammy and their kids came in from LaRange. My nephew, Alan Searson and Anna came in from uh, Calgary and uh, we just had a marvelous time. It was a big shindig. We were all celebrating life and it was just a, a really beautiful uh, Christmas. And I'm glad that we did this before COVID hit because we had no idea that COVID was coming. Next. So when I was going through my really, really difficult time, uh, when I was just about ready to check out and, and I really truly was contemplating um, not committing suicide, but just ready to give up on life because I was so desperate when I had shingles and when I was sleep deprived, I just felt awful. And so these were my primary reasons for continuing to be here. I had gone to see a body talk therapist and uh, she said to me, you know, you have a choice to make. She said, you can either be here or you can go because I was getting visitors from the other side that were beckoning me. And, you know, it was almost like I could leave this body, leave this pain behind and, and everything would be okay. And one of my sisters had passed. And uh, so she was visiting me. And these were my, my grandchildren. I absolutely adore my grandchildren. And uh, they had lost, if you see in the picture in the center, those are my three children. Shannon is the redhead, Josh is in the middle, and Sasha is on the right. And that's her husband, Jonathan. And uh, Gavin, whom I have my hand on, is Shannon's husband. They had come to visit us from British Columbia. And so, of course, we went to Los Palapas. And uh, so Jonathan had lost his father, Ian Walls around the time that I was getting ready for a transplant. And I saw the devastating impact that it had on uh, my grandchildren. And so because I had lost my mother when I was so young, I didn't wish for that to happen to them. So when I went to see the body talk therapist, she said, you can go either way. She said, but if you want to be here, she said, you better let the creator know you want to be here. She said, if it means stamping your feet, then that's what you do. And of course, you know, I, I, after that, I said, I can't bear to do that to my children, my grandchildren for them to, to lose me when they've already lost their, their grandpa on Jonathan's side of the family. And so I asked creator, I said, let me stay. I really want to stay. And it was almost like something shifted inside of my body because my intention then was made known to the universe. And so I prayed. And so the reason why I'm here today, I believe, is because of a lot of prayer from my community, a lot of love, and also the desire to be here for the future. And so I'm very blessed to be here today. And uh, my grandchildren are so special to me. I just adore them. And the one on the left there is uh, Lotus Josie Jane Walls. And she was born four days before my transplant. So that was the messenger, you know, that I needed to be here. And I got to hold her in my arms. And then I was so blessed uh, to also get Miss Luna. She's named after the moon. And that's my son, Josh, and his uh, partner, beautiful woman, uh, inside and out, Alexis, and that's their daughter. And uh, on the left-hand side there, of course, there's Ava Grace. Uh, she's kind of like the mini mom. And then Nala is the real trickster figure there on the right-hand side. 
and there's uh, Miss uh, Lotus and then Milo. Everybody thinks he's a girl because he's so doggone cute. And, uh, you know, as if boys can't be cute, but he's like super cute. And, uh, and then, um, of course, Ms. Luna. And so I'm just so blessed to be here. And my daughter, Shannon, is a songstress. Um, they were nominated for a Juno Award. And I got to see her perform at the Inspire Awards uh, one year, my husband and I. So I'm very blessed uh, to have the family that I have. Next. And so there's the famous Susanna D'April. She's also another kidney transplant uh, recipient. She had lupus and uh, she just celebrated uh, 12 years of having her beaner. That's what she calls her kidney. And so one of the things about having kidney disease is that if you open yourself up to other people, they open themselves up to you. And so you can forge some really meaningful close relationships and I asked uh, to have this picture in the center because I absolutely was treated so well after my transplant by these nurses. And uh, they support the Kidney Foundation. And Dr. Moser is an amazing transplant surgeon. And there's a team of about four of them. And they just do a phenomenal job. And then Sandra Young Chief was also at that uh, kidney soiree. And uh, she now has a kidney transplant as well uh, from a deceased donor. So people, sign your deceased donor cards and let your family know your wishes and sign the organ donor registry because you have an opportunity to make a huge difference in someone's life to keep them here. And so Sandra is really, really happy. I'm sure Renelda can speak to that as well. So um, next slide, please. And I wanted to show this. This was a trip that my husband and I had taken this past summer. Um, we had a bit of a reprieve there from COVID. So I wanted to go and reconnect with my father's spirit. So I wanted to go to uh, British Columbia, Blue River. So we ended up staying in Valmont. in that uh, shiny uh, uh, Corvette, the 2014 Corvette Stingray. That's my husband's baby there. But anyway, we went on a three and a half hour, hour hike, hike, pardon me. And then on another day, we went on a five hour hike. So we had just a fantastic time. And honest to God, you know, when I, I was talking to uh, Dr. Brody the other day. She's my GP and she's just totally awesome. And I said to her, you know, when I was really sick, you told me that I would have no idea how bad I felt until I got my kidney transplant. And she was a thousand percent right. It's like, I, I can't even begin to express the difference in how my body feels. It's like, I'm back in my body. I'm fully in my body. I have energy. There were days, I remember one time when I just had so little energy that I, uh, I either had a choice to vacuum my area carpet in the living room or I could floss my teeth. I did not have enough energy to do both. So that's how depleted your energy gets when your kidney function declines. And so for me to be able to transform into a semblance of what I was before. And my husband said to me, I feel like I got my wife back. You know, the one that, that uh, he married, the one that had the energy that was hiking. And so I'm just grateful, you know, he's just been so kind and so loving and I could not ask for a better partner. And so my message there is that find yourself a really good partner. If it's a good friend, it doesn't have to be a romantic uh, partner. It could be your grandma. It could be, you know, your nephew. It could be somebody that keeps you company and helps you through your journey. Those are so important to have, especially now with COVID. Next. And so this was taken uh, July 23rd of 2011. My husband and I have been together for 25 years, and you can tell by the expression on his face, he's wondering, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> so here we are getting married in Larange, 
And uh, there we are in the backyard of my sister Josie and my uh, brother-in-law George. They prepared the backyard. And I absolutely feel so blessed to have the family um, that I have. And uh, some of them are now starting to have a few um, health concerns as well. And so we try very much to love and support one another. On the left-hand side there, um, the woman in the orange is my sister Arlene, who was the first person to uh, want to be my donor. And then, of course, my son Josh is up on the top right-hand side in the black. And these are some of my nieces and nephews and uh, siblings. And you'll probably recognize uh, Keith at the top and Linda. Keith recently had a heart attack and uh, is also um, uh, now recuperating at home. We were very, very scared we would lose him. And so we're ever so grateful that he's still with us today. And then my sister, uh, Brenda, in the center there in the white uh, dress and the brown shirt is um, also on hemodialysis and has had a few heart attacks. So those seem to run in our, our family. So, um, you know, I'm here today. I'm still able to celebrate life. And uh, family seems even more precious now than ever before. And same with my community. Next. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my canine companion, Clark. <laughs> Clark sat with me many times when I was too sick to move. And he is one of the most sensitive dogs. He, you can tell by his eyes, he's very gentle. And sometimes when I was in a lot of pain or I was sitting somewhere uh, crying, he would just come and he would just sit by me and he would just comfort me with his presence. So it's good to have a companion. And I think with COVID, a lot more people have companions now. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you for uh, listening and participating. And if you have any uh, questions or comments, Egoset. Thank you for sharing um, your journey. Thank you for such, um, I guess, such a personal connection with each of us as, as you shared that journey. And, and just uh, wanted, to, um, wanted to say thank you for raising awareness about the importance of organ donation and transplantation. It's, it's a huge, huge issue. And I think for Indigenous people, um, there's issues around access, there's issues around what everything that you talked about. So we really, really deeply appreciate your sharing today. It's so generous of you. We do want to open this up. If anybody has any comments or any questions, um, now's the time to ask. Thanks, Lori. We, um, Monica, if you're comfortable, if we give out your email address or if we, if we connect people to you, if they want to connect on a more personal basis, um, or if you want to connect through the organ donation and transplant network that, uh, we'll make that available as well. Sure. I'm, I'm comfortable with, with either option. I have a question. Okay, so if it's, yep. Yeah. Um, how long was it from, uh, how long, like how much time was it from the point where uh, Jimmy was um, tested to the point of the actual uh, I, um, transplant? I think one of the things that uh, Jimmy did was he really pushed uh, the uh, transplant um, coordinator to escalate uh, the process. So I think it may have taken, seems to me, uh, would have taken maybe about six months. Like normally it takes about a year, but uh, I think because my health was in such crisis at the time, uh, it kind of spurred him on to move, have them move quicker. But it can take quite a long time uh, for, for the workup because when you become a donor, the, it's almost like the, uh, they do an X-ray of your entire body you know, there's the tissue typing that has to take place. 
There's uh, also, of course, the blood has to, to match. So there's a lot of factors and the person has to be healthy. It can take quite a while. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Me too, Tr Judy. Hi, Monica. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Oh, you should share some of your story, Renelda. What you just, uh, the story you told, it just reminded me a lot, like how sick I was too when I was on dialysis and also receiving that call from the doctor that they found a kidney for me and it just brought me tears when you were just talking about it. So I totally almost forgot about it. I was just crying here. And yes, receiving the gift of life is amazing. It gives you a better quality of life. Like you'd never know these little stuff that you appreciate, especially water. You're <laughs> water. <laughs> when you're on dialysis, you're not able to drink that much water. You gotta be careful with your fluids. And just the food tastes so much better too. It's still tasting the metallic taste. And especially with energy, you get a lot of energy and you start like you appreciate little stuff in life. And um, one thing that kept me going was my son. I didn't want to leave him. My kidney it was like below five percent for both of them. So I just wanted to live for my boy. So thank you, Monica, for this party. I think you need to be the featured speaker too, Renelda, because uh, you know, Renelda was in the hospital when uh, Jimmy and I uh, were there. She almost uh, rejected her kidney. And, uh, and uh, another person uh, was, uh, who's the other young woman that we're friends with, uh, Custer? Um, anyway, there's there's a whole network of people in the north, and uh, Renelda is pretty amazing, you know, uh, going to university. And uh, what are you working on, Renelda, right now? What degree? Uh, I'm in the general and applied linguistics. I'm just in my last semester, and I'll be and I'll be done. Any job prospects? Mm, I'm working currently, but I do have one job a uh, casual with um the with the linguistics department research assistant wow that sounds pretty promising that's exciting yeah. yes thank you for sharing that Renelda. which reminds me i need more water <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hydrate the kidney that's right i'll be right back keep talking i can hear you <laughs> i find that Renelda. funny Um, and, and nice that you'll join us today. Yes, I really wanted to join, so listen to Monica. I find it funny, Monica, you always talk about drinking water too, so yeah, that's a good reminder. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things they really tell you to do uh, to hydrate your kidney. And I remember, you, you know, when Renelda reminded me that you could barely drink any water when you were on uh, dialysis, uh, the, the peritoneal. And uh, the other thing too is I wish that there would be some researchers at the university that would uh, create a better alternative than the sugary uh, solutions that they use for peritoneal fluid. Because many people that, that the two of the leading uh, contributors to um, kidney disease, are high blood pressure and also diabetes. So those are the two major contributors for those of us uh, that develop uh, kidney disease. And of course, in my case, having a uh, uh, having a genetic defect. I don't know what your story is, Renelda. Do, do you like? Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah. How you <laughs> kidney disease? 
they found um IgA nephropathy. I can say that word. It's also known as um Berger's disease, which is pretty much these uh, virus that go into your kidney. You, you know, those little valves like it goes into your kidney, so it eats away your kidney from the inside. Wow. So I've had it since in my teenage years. I will get like pains on my back, but I just brushed it off until 2016. That's when my results came back that both of my kidneys were 30% functioning. And at the end of uh, 2016, no, 2017, I mean, uh, January 2017, that's where I got tested. But 30% functioning and then until August, that's when both of my kidneys de declined to 5% functioning. So I had to be on hemodialysis right away because I was already sleeping all day, vomiting. I wasn't able to move, everything hurt. So that's when I had to go into emergency hemodialysis. That's a scary time. Yeah. Your mother's been a really good support for you, hey, Rinalda? Yeah, my mom's been there. And also she was busy, but she was like, um, making sure I was taken care of too. Most days I had to go to like hemodialysis alone. So. It's interesting when you shared your story and you said your uh, son was part of your motivation uh, for staying alive. You know, that's something that we share. It's like, you know, my husband would get along fine without me. My children would get along fine without me, but I felt like my little grandchildren needed me. So that's interesting when you share that as well. You know, they're concerned about being here for the younger people to help support and encourage them. So good for you. I'm so glad you're here, Renelda. I'm happy to, you. to be alive. When COVID's over, we're going to have to celebrate properly. Yeah, yes, it's going to be two years in March. Really? March what? March 8th. March 8th. Wow, I better write that down here. That's <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. That's yeah. awesome. Also, when you mentioned that um, talk to your body, that's what I did also. That was the first week, March 5th, no, March 7th, before I got that call. March 7th, I got the call. So it's March 6th. That's when I was sitting alone at home. I was like, thank you, God, that I'm living, um, doing this dialysis for my boy, making sure I, didn't, I, I did my parental dialysis on time watching my diet, my fluids intake, so. And then that's when I prayed. I was like, thank you, God, I'm still here. I accept my condition and I was just grateful. I was admiring everything that was around me, like little, little details. And then I went to bed and I was getting ready for school after I finished my dialysis exchange. And that's when I got the call. I just, I just cried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's really joyful, and it's nice to have the ability, uh, you know, to be able to uh, process, uh, you know, our tears of happiness, sometimes uh, tears of sadness, but so important to uh, celebrate. And even this morning, uh, when I woke up, uh, I could hear Walter Linklater's uh, voice in my head saying, "Pray before your feet touch the floor." And I was just about to uh, get off my bed and I have a little carpet. And uh, just before my feet, I said, thank you, Creator, for letting me be here today. And I was looking forward to uh, spending time with uh, some of my friends. And I see Dr. Helen Horseman is there. Helen, what are you doing there? <laughs> thank you so much. This is just a beautiful presentation. And... Um... Monica since the mid 1980s when Monica was in the first sun pep class that I ever taught at the University of Regina and you know when you taught in sun pep you uh, these students were just not your stu your your students they were your friends and Monica and I became friends then and we've stayed friends ever since and Monica I always remember saying at the end of the classes that that I always learn so much more from you folks than I know that you ever learned from me and I'm still learning from you and certainly from your presentation today so I just want to say a special thanks to you for that 
SunTap was uh, was a wonderful uh, experience. I, I would say it was one of the most uh, transformative experiences of my life because we were so blessed to have uh, wonderful uh, teachers like uh, Helen Horseman, uh, Liz Cooper, Sherry Farrell Reset. Uh, I remember we even had uh, Oliver Brass. He's now passed on, but we had some phenomenal. It was a very very special time uh, to be in Suntep in uh, Regina at that point. I'm still friends with uh, Calvin Reset and Teresa Fayant, and that's the beauty of uh, Facebook. And Helen donated this most gorgeous, gorgeous quilt uh, for our fundraiser, so I still have it sitting in a bag um, in, in, my, uh, in my room. And so we're looking forward to auctioning that off uh, when the time comes for our uh, fundraiser. So thank you so much for joining us today, Helen, and uh, for being such a good friend even after all these years. You bet. It's my pleasure, Monica. Thanks. And who else is with us that would like to say something? Is that Deb? Are you on mute? <laughs> I was. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, I was on mute. <laughs> no, this so, was really interesting listening to your story. So thank you so much. And it certainly took me back. Um, my dad had kidney disease. And, um, Anyways, I guess my video is poor, so I see it switched off. But at any rate, my my dad had kidney disease and had a transplant many, many years ago, way back in the 70s. And it is so different now. But I remember that puffy look and the uh, energy he lost. And, um, and he was that way through most of my teenage years. So, yeah. So, I remember that. So, it brought back some of those memories. And then later on, I discovered I had the same disease, although... For some reason, my kidneys are fine and I'm well into my 60s. So I guess we'll never know exactly what that's about. But when you talk about talking to your body, I've certainly done that. And I did it at the time. I think I was 20 when I was diagnosed. So really young as well. And I had probably had it for many years. And yeah. And and I remember visualizing a kidney bean because that was my only, my only real understanding of kidneys at the time with a bite taken out of it. And I would slowly imagine the little pieces of the kidney going back in place anyway. So, so that's what I did. And I basically said to my kidney, heal yourself. <laughs> I still have it, but it's never progressed. So that's been completely unexpected. Um, didn't think I'd still be here, but here I am. So when I when I hear you talk about the gift of life, I certainly value that as well. Thank you for sharing that, Deb. So when did your uh, father uh, pass? Uh, way back in the 70s. So in 1977, his kidney transplant only lasted for three years. And the, the anti-rejection medications weren't as good back then. And he suffered immensely the first... Well, the first six to eight months, then he had a really good year and then it's then the transplant started to fail and then the last six months were excruciating again. So, yeah, so that was rough. That is rough, you know, and, and, and I think, um, and I'm sure uh, Renelda can attest to this as well. You know, when you're diagnosed with uh, kidney disease, you really don't understand what that means. And uh, so the educational component is really important. And I find that um, for a lot of uh, young people, I don't think there's enough education that's being done to prevent kidney uh, disease from happening in the first place. Because I think some people, uh, you know, the chronic kidney disease uh, unit, they're the ones that uh, delay the progression but I find that throughout my journey, one of the things that I'd like to do is spend time with the, with the, uh, the staff at uh, St. Paul's Hospital 
to be able to tell them a little bit more information, you know, from a patient perspective, you know, what are some of the things that they can do uh, to improve uh, awareness? Because I find for me, I don't know if this was the same with you, uh, Ronelda, but I felt like I wish that they would have given me more information at the outset in terms of here's the, the chronic uh, kidney disease, and then this is where you go if you get peritoneal, almost like an orientation, you know, to the entire, because uh, there's various units within uh, St. Paul's Hospital. And then, of course, the, now we're dealing with a, with a transplant clinic, which is where you go after, so you're constantly being shifted. And then I know a young woman, Winnie White Bear, that also needs a kidney transplant. And uh, for the young people that uh, have kidney disease, they go to a clinic at the Royal University Hospital, but then when they turn 18, they're switched over to St. Paul's Hospital, but there isn't like a transition. And so the grandmother reached out to me and said, you know, it's almost like they don't want the mother involved anymore in with her daughter because her mother was very involved with Winnie's treatment when she attended RUH, but as soon as she turned 18, now she's an adult, right? And so there was no kind of parent advocacy there that was available. It seemed like they didn't want her involved is what I was told. Did you find that at all, Renelda? Yeah, because it was a sudden news to me when the, um, when the doctor, um, Dr. David Reed, uh, told me that there was 30% functioning and he didn't really explain he just explained my condition and told me dialysis. I didn't know what the heck dialysis was. Like anything, like what do you do? Like do you just inject or something or? And then after that, I was getting a lot of information. It was overload, especially emotionally. Being told that my quality of life may decline. Like they didn't even mention kidney transplant then too. So I had to self-educate on what talking about so and I had a cousin that was on dialysis too and I didn't know what he was doing so that's where I had to like kind of teach myself what everything is especially your blood anything <laughs> so it was like a shock to me it's overwhelming and just to process what's happening emotionally and then of course when your emotions are so strong sometimes you have a hard time processing information pragmatically and so you almost need a time where you're able to process what's going on to be able to cry your tears to get mad whatever you need to do but then to sit down with somebody and then be able to take the information in right so there needs to be more education and I think this is where our network is really important because we focus on uh, First Nations and uh, Métis organ donation and transplantation there needs to be more education done you know, because there's some people that are interested in becoming kidney donors, but they don't even know what, how to go about doing that. And there's also like a transplant uh, coordinator here in Saskatoon and also one in Regina, but there really should be one in LaRange, you know, yeah. because if we're being disproportionately affected by, uh, by um, you know, kidney disease. You know, because there's such a prevalence of uh, diabetes, right, in our community, and also high blood pressure. I don't think I know anybody that's that doesn't have diabetes or high blood pressure. You know, there are very few people that don't. Mm -hmm. A lot of people with kidney disease have to travel to Saskatoon and Prince Albert. So it's, it's like a big gap right from there's a lot of like there needs to be maybe like dialysis machines or something to be brought to them or instead of traveling from like way up north i have a I few wonder, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just there's a few people who have kidney disease and that started dialysis up north so they have to like travel constantly especially other communities up north so they're I was thinking about that the other day too. As we live in Saskatoon, it's easy access for us. And where we can just get home to after. Yeah, I was talking about all Nathan Hospital. 
and the um, uh, Pasigao Masqua, the Rising Bear um, Health Center that they now have opened. And it's dealing with uh, chronic disease for primarily for Indigenous people, although the hospital is open to in, in Treaty 4 territory. But I was thinking about, um, I wonder if there would be, and, but the uh, Rising Bear, uh, Red Bear um, Rising Center, um, basically they deal with dialysis and with a lot of Indigenous people, and they offer that service right within the hospital, which is fabulous. I forget how many chairs they have available there. But I was wondering, Monica, something we could advocate for with Tammy is talking about the new health centre that's going to be opening in Larange, and I don't know what the parameters are around that health centre, but I wonder if there might be opportunity for advocacy for having um, dialysis available there. Or within their within their health, uh, the hospital and and the health centers in the north. At least it would provide better access, I think, than what they currently have. I actually had a, a preliminary uh, conversation with uh, Tammy and uh, Jimmy not that long ago, and they would love to see a hemodialysis unit right in Larange. And uh, that's an excellent point, Val. And I think it's something that we definitely should uh, pursue because uh, with, with, uh, when, when you have kidney disease, um, it raises awareness of other people around you on the impact. And uh, they, their daughter, Vanessa, as you know, she's a, she's a nurse and went through the nursing program there. Uh, Vanessa was uh, tending to a young woman that was on hemodialysis in Larange, and uh, she decided to not pursue hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, and uh, she passed away. And they were really impacted by that because she left behind some young children. And one of the things that people don't seem to understand is that when you're dealing with chronic disease, sometimes uh, you, well, it, it's pretty common for people to have anxiety and depression. And when you have depression, you can't make good decisions sometimes. And there's a lot of people that I'm aware of that have chosen to die because they have a fear of the operation or sometimes they don't know the procedure. And uh, so sometimes people will choose to die. And, and sometimes also part of the reason is because there's a lack of donors. And uh, with the presumed uh, consent that they're now starting in Nova Scotia, uh, you know, to me, that's an important step because I think people, the, if we could harvest more kidneys, from people that have passed, I think if they knew in their passing that they were going to be able to save a life, I think more people would do it and let their their uh, families know that they wish to be a, a donor. Uh, you know, when they when they pass, because even when Verna St. Dennis was sharing her story, you know, she said that uh, when Adam passed away, I think by salvaging uh, uh, his you know, donating his um, organs. I think he helped save something like six lives, you know, because they can harvest the lungs, the hearts and that type of thing. And even the corneas, right? There's a lot of corneal transplants, but we definitely need a hemodialysis unit. And as I'm thinking about this, I don't know about you, Rhonda, with our transplantation network, I would love to have a focused discussion with people like Rinalda, with Celia, with Val, you know, with the, with the College of Medicine and, and also the College of Nursing and pursue this idea of providing support for people in the North by having a hemodialysis unit available. I think we really should advocate for that. I think that's what do you think? fabulous idea. Maybe we could um, bring in, um, I don't know who it would be, but I could check into it, people from, uh, um, All Nations Healing Hospital to kind of talk about the process and how did they get that established? 
on Treaty 4 territory and what who was involved and how did they were they able to advocate for that? Because I think they've kind of created the pathway forward for Indigenous people in the South, but we definitely need to pursue this for people in the North. And having people like Dr. McKinney at the table and others who are working in the North around physician health and, and health care would be a wise thing as well. And she has connections to um, to the government and, and maybe some opportunities for what does this look like? Because it's going to take resources, obviously. Yeah. And the reason why we're focused on First Nations and Métis, I remember when I first started, um, uh, you know, meeting with the people in the transplant, Dr. Uh, Gavin Beck was one of the transplant surgeons. And he said, you know, Monica, the greatest need exists in your community. And uh, so there's definite acknowledgement from the transplant surgeons that they see this need. And uh, the other area that I see, uh, you know, um, which is kind of difficult is um, the immigrant uh, community, like the newly arrived uh, immigrants. One time I was at uh, hemodialysis and my heart broke for this. Um, they were an elderly uh, East Indian couple. And uh, they were, the, the woman was bringing her husband to dialysis, hemodialysis, but they were also raising her grandchildren. And I thought, my God, and, and you know, like, how do people, how, how do people do this, you know, without the adequate support? So I think anything that we can do to make things better for people, to provide them with the necessary emotional support, uh, to demystify the process. You know, we have so many skilled people in our community. Like I look at Renelda's story. Renelda, do you speak Dene as well? You know, Renelda is definitely somebody, you know, that could do interpretation, you know, for some of the people that speak Dene uh, to be able to demystify the process. So I hope you're getting lots of ideas, Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other thing I was thinking about as you ladies were talking was too is about how we're how we're training our students and I think about our students and how important the uh, patient narratives are to educating and training all of our medical students and our residents and practicing physicians around what are the issues what are the concerns what what was your journey like and what was your story because in my mind that has the greatest impact students can slides about kind of the technical um, health, um, um, I guess, um, terms and, and the, uh, the detail around that, but they're not really hearing the stories, I think, to the extent maybe that they need to. And so I think that would be an important aspect of how we're training um, people to care for Indigenous people in this province and beyond. And I think that's, that's another important area where we could have an impact Absolutely. Yeah. Who's the other person that's on the line here that I just see the telephone, but don't see the person. Maybe they have something oh, to. I think, that's, uh, I think that's Allison. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she okay. was driving. She was going to try and tune in. And I don't know that she can participate necessarily because she's driving, but she was yeah. going to try and tune in. So I'm pretty sure that's her. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds <laughs> Allison. <laughs> don't, don't don't drive and be on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, you know we're a little small group, but we're mighty. So, if we can affect some positive changes for other people, boy, I'm committed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Rhonda. I, I'd like to recommend that we have Renelda come and share her story with our uh, committee, you know, the next time our, our committee meets. And uh, yeah, so uh, Val, uh, I think we'll need you to guide us through next steps in terms of how do we make some of these things happen? Because I do know that uh, Tammy is willing to meet with our group at some point as well but we probably need to do some uh, work beforehand to get things to a stage where we can have that conversation. You know, probably mean doing some speaking in, in your neck of the woods there to see how open people are. I think, um, I think it would be good to bring in um, um, Veronica McKinney. 
yeah. physician who is the director of Northern Medical Services to kind of talk about what would this look like from that aspect. Maybe have Tammy, maybe have a smaller group discussion, to, like you said, to start with, just to kind of discuss all of these things and, and what is the way forward. So yeah. Yeah, I think that would be really important. Absolutely. So I guess we're, well, are we done? Here? Yeah, we're done here. And yeah, thanks again, Monica, for and for sharing your story. It is so critically important for people to hear these stories and the impacts um, that healthcare can have and have on, on people's lives. And you too as well, Ronalda, thank you so much for being so willing to share your journey and your pathway. So I think we've got some ideas. We've got maybe um, a way that we can start connecting to the North and, and really advocate for, for better um, organ donation and transplant. I think a little bit too about my cousin Bruce who traveled to Edmonton and recently had a liver transplant and the difference it has made in his life. So the whole area of, of transplant for Indigenous people is hugely important. And I can't stress that enough. And how the quality of life, connections to family, to grandchildren, it's amazing, Monica, that you're still here with us and that you're still here with us. So thank you both for sharing. Yeah, it was an honor and a blessing. And oh my goodness, I'm just going to be floating on a cloud all day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to wish everybody a great day. We will have this available. So Monica and Ronaldo will send this out to folks so they can um, revisit the, um, I guess, the tape version of this. And we will continue planning the way forward. Awesome. And thanks uh, for joining us, Deb. And I have a question to ask you, Deb Fair. Did you used yes. to go to Bible college? Did I used to go to what? Did you ever go to Bible college? I did. I wonder if I went to Bible college with you. Where did you go? I went to Swift Current. Where did you go? Oh, I went to CPC here in the city. Oh, but okay. I, I, I went to Bible college with a Deb Fair. Oh, well, there's and, a whole bunch of us. <laughs> well, I'm sure there is now. <laughs> but I just had to ask that question. What a small world. My goodness. It really is. Yeah. But thank it you so really much is. for uh, joining us today, Deb. And what, what, tell me a little bit about your kidney journey again. Like, what is your diagnosis and what, what stage are you at and that type of thing? Well, I'm at the very, I'm still at the very early stages. I would die. I was diagnosed at 20. My dad died when I was 22. Um, yeah. And it has never really progressed. It's a type of uh, nephritis. I yeah. thought that was the diagnosis, but I've since been told by my sister, who's a physician, that that's a very nonspecific diagnosis. But all I know is mm -hmm. it's the same kind as my dad had. And, um, what it has done in terms of my journey, I have just tried to live a careful life. I've been like, I probably would drink more, would have drank more and smoked more, especially as a younger person, if I hadn't known I had this, but I knew that my dad's was made worse by the fact that he smoked for many years and he drank for many years, not excessively to my knowledge, but still, so I was more careful with those things. It's not that I didn't do them at all. It's just I was more careful. So, so I'm kind of at a stall. But the same thing that caused my kidney disease has also caused my heart disease. So they're connected. Wow. Because when I was pregnant, with, when I had, when I gave birth to my daughter, I have one child, biologically, two non-biologically. Um, but my, I went into complete. Um, I don't know if it was kidney failure or if it was. There's a difference between failure and when they just stop working. And I went into a where they stopped working. And at that point, I just about died. My daughter just about died. And so, but then afterwards it bounced back. So I was just really, really fortunate. And, but as a result of that, I had one biological child and no more. Um, and, and after that, I was on medication for things like hypertension and 
you know, the stuff that goes with kidney disease, right? Yeah. So that was kind of my journey. But since then, it's been really stable. So it's, I've just been really fortunate, blessed. I don't know why, but lucky, <laughs> all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and and now as a result of some of the same factors, I guess because of the chronic slight underfunctioning of my kidney, it's it's created the heart problem that I have. So that's probably why I have heart disease today. So it's it's can it's not diabetes, but it's kind of similar in that it affects multiple organs. So just the the kidney chronically being stressed has like since I was 20, I guess, has created the issues with my heart. So, yeah, one of the, one of the things I learned uh, about kidney disease with all the research I've done is that most people that have kidney disease are likely to die of heart attack or stroke. So yes. it becomes really, yes. really imperative to, uh, you know, are you diabetic yes. as well, Deb? No, I've never had high blood sugar. I've never had high cholesterol. I, according to all the charts, I should have been zero risk for a heart attack, but I had one nonetheless. My yeah. sister said it probably started when I was pregnant with my daughter and went into that failure. She's the physician. She said that's probably when it all started. Oh, okay. Yeah. The heart stuff. Yeah. Wow. Lo too much yeah. stress for your body. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know what your function is right now, Deb? My function is completely normal. It's, it's, it's all within the normal ranges for my age. Oh, wow. That's positive. Yeah. That's really, really good. Wow. But I still have the same marker of kidney disease that I had when I started. I still have that. But my kidney function has been fine. Uh -huh. It was more a surprise that <laughs> it was my heart that was affected by the slight, um, like kidney, well, you know, kidneys, kidney problems cause hypertension. They cause high blood right. pressure. Yeah. And so I've had that my whole well, since I was in my 20s. And so that's kind of, and even though it's been treated, there's been times, I guess, when it hasn't been and I haven't even known it. And, mm -hmm. and anyways, that affected my heart, so. Wow. So do you belong to any online support groups? I don't. I don't. Well, I, I have, and maybe I could, I don't know. But I have, um, like one of my sisters is a physician. One of my sisters is a nurse. <laughs> mm -hmm. When something happens or I have a question, they come right, yeah. like instantly. They're there within as long as it takes them to drive there. They will come and be with me. So when on, you talk on, about sisters, that's a blessing. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Now, one of the things you might consider doing is uh, if you're on Facebook at all, you can mm -hmm. Google uh, kidney transplant groups, and there's many of them. And I have found them uh, to be very beneficial. You know, sometimes you can pose questions, and you hear about other people's stories. And uh, it's it's a good way to connect, especially now during uh, COVID. So that's something yes. I would encourage you to do. And then you don't feel so isolated, you know, other people are, are dealing with issues as well. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Hi, Kathy. You're, you're on you. mute. Yes. So uh, thank you for sharing your journey, Deb, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. And you also. Yeah. You're a good reminder to me that kidney transplant today looks very different than it did many years ago. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> a lot safer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How much time did we have, Rhonda? Are we out of time? Yeah, I think we were going to 11.30. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this has been great. Yeah. yeah. Looks like we may have a, another joiner here. I can certainly chat with her if she wants to chat, if anybody has to leave. Sure. I will be signing out. Thank you so much, all of you. Yes, thanks, Deb. Bye-bye. All the best I'm on your journey. I'm going to sign out as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry yeah. I missed the presentation. I just saw that it was on and I thought, oh, I'll go look there. <laughs> I had a few minutes between things and I thought I could learn something. But um, yeah, I don't, I had, um, 
I had a, a tenant live with me who had kidney failure and had a transplant and he was quite young and he's decided never to marry because he said, I'm going to die. And I'm like, but we're all going to die one day, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, you know, I'm sure that, that they have a much um, less rejection problems now than they did years ago. Yeah, things are a lot better now than they were back in the past. That's for sure. So where do you live, Kathy? Pardon? Where do you live? Where are you from? I'm in Saskatoon. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So my fellow had come from Swift Current and and he adopted me. He lived here seven years and I still see him. And so I'm his date once in a while, but now with COVID, we can't go out. Oh. <laughs> Funny, eh? But yeah, yeah. I'm amazed at, at the kidney stuff because um, my mom and my dad are both elderly. And so I have been going through kidney failure problems with them, like acute attacks because they're senior and everything's slowing down. Mm -hmm. Anyway, both of your parents? I, yeah, so it's interesting. So I thought, well, I'll go over there for a few minutes and try to learn something. I have to go now. My boss is ready to meet. Okay, well, good to talk to you. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.